All right, guys. Tonight's lecture is about reading a solubility curve. Before we get into the curve itself, there's a few things we need to discuss. We briefly talked in some of our classes about factors that affect solubility of a solute in its solution. And uh, in building with the class discussion, we decided that temperature, surface area, meaning the size of the particles, agitation, whether you stir or not, type of solvent, whether you use water or oil or vinegar or rubbing alcohol, and concentration itself, whether you add too much solute, all affect solubility. But we skipped a few terms that we're going to address right now. When we're talking about concentration, we've spent a lot of time in the past few days discussing mass percent, molarity, molality, and dilution calculations. But there's another way to look at this. We can consider a solution as being unsaturated, saturated, or supersaturated, which are all terms that you became familiar with when you completed your crossword puzzle. Let's take a look. If a solution is considered to be saturated, then it contains as much solute as will dissolve at a particular temperature. So imagine making your Kool-Aid and you add exactly one cup, like the directions tell you, uh, of sugar to two quarts. That will dissolve because that is the amount that they measured to make a saturated solution. Now let's say you are a little creative and you don't really want to measure out exactly one cup, so you don't put enough sugar in, you just pour it, you eyeball it, stir it up, and it tastes watered down. Then we consider that solution unsaturated. Unsaturated solutions are solutions that allow us to add more. The solution itself has not reached the limit of solute, or in our case for Kool-Aid, the amount of sugar that will dissolve at that particular temperature. Now, let's say you get real crafty here, and you add more than one cup of sugar, and you make the water hot and extra sugar goes into solution. We consider that a supersaturated solution. Supersaturated solutions are solutions that contain more solute than can normally be dissolved at a particular temperature. One example of this is when uh, a real life example of a supersaturated solution is something called simple syrup. This is where you dissolve more sugar than can normally be dissolved in water. Typically, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, one cup of sugar to one cup of water, and you heat it until the solution looks clear, like clear water. It's a little thicker, though. We call this simple syrup. There's a number of uses for it in cooking, and you can actually use that as a hummingbird feed for a hummingbird feeder. Scientists have done a lot of work for us, and they have created what we call a solubility curve or solubility chart. Here's an example of your solubility chart on your worksheet. We read this by considering each line or each point that falls on the line as being a saturated point for that particular chemical. So if we look at potassium nitrate, we can see that at 50 degrees Celsius, um, let me get a color here, guys. Hold on one second. At 50 degrees Celsius, if we come all the way up, we can read that 80 grams of potassium nitrate will dissolve in 100 grams of water. Please take a look at that y-axis. The grams of solute per 100 grams of water. That tells us that all of this work has been done with 100 milliliters of water, all right? The x-axis is the temperature because we can change that. Now, if we continue to heat the potassium nitrate, say we heat 100 grams of water to 70 degrees Celsius, then we can go all the way up and we see that 130 grams of potassium nitrate will dissolve in 100 grams of water. So if we cool this down. Let's say we take 130 grams of the potassium nitrate and we dissolve it in 100 grams of water at 70 degrees Celsius. And we cool that down all the way to the 50 degrees Celsius. So let's see here. 
right here. We would consider that a supersaturated solution because we have more grams of potassium nitrate that is dissolved in 100 grams of water than can normally be, normal is, at, is 80, than can normally be dissolved at that particular temperature. If you do something, such as tap the side of the glass, add a seed crystal, put a piece of rope in there, stick a stirring rod in there, you'll cause this amount to precipitate out. So in order to maintain stability, um, well let me back up, supersaturated solutions are not very stable so it doesn't take much. You literally can tap the glass and sometimes crystals will start forming. But this difference here from 130 to 180 is 50 grams, right? So when we look here we can see that 50 grams would precipitate out to make us some pretty crystals. Again, just to recap, the reason why 50 grams of crystals would produce, be produced is because if we start out with a supersaturated solution right here, say we heat up the solution to 70 degrees, the 130 grams dissolves, we then cool it back down. Technically, only 80 grams can be dissolved at that point. So the 50 grams have got to precipitate out. So we will see 50 grams of crystals now let's say that we only have 60 grams of potassium nitrate dissolved at 50 degrees Celsius. Well, we already established that 80 grams can be dissolved at 50 degrees Celsius, but if we only add 60, we have room to add 20 additional grams, okay? Does everybody see that? Right here, we can add up to 20 more grams. So, if we're at 60 grams, we're below the line and we consider that solution to be unsaturated. All right, let's get rid of some things here. Let's see. I'm going to Sorry about that. Okay. We can also take a look at the graph and see which chemicals are the least soluble at different temperatures. If I ask you which chemical is the least soluble at 20 degrees Celsius, you will go to 20 degrees Celsius and find your first line. And the lowest line happens to be potassium chlorate. So you would answer potassium chlorate is the least soluble chemical on this table at 20 degrees Celsius. All right, let's take and get rid of that then. All right. Now we can also calculate the average rate of increase. If we take a look at something such as uh, the sodium nitrate, and we want to know what the average rate increase of solubility is from, say, 30 degrees until 60 degrees, we can calculate that. Average rate is simply slope. Slope, if you recall, is your y2 minus y1 divided by your x2 minus x1. So we need to do some estimating, okay? Our y2 looks like it's about say 123 grams, right? Right there. So 123 grams. Our Y1 looks like it's roughly 97, so minus 97 grams divided by 60 degrees Celsius minus 30 degrees Celsius. When we do this, we get 26 grams divided by 30 degrees Celsius. And unlike your math class, we, actu we actually need the decimal, if you recall from the fall. So when we do the division, we get 0.87 grams of sodium nitrate per 100 grams of water per degree C. So this is how you would calculate the slope of the graph to find the average rate increase of solubility. All right, let me clear the screen. All 
All right. Another thing we can do is we can use proportions and solve for amounts of solute that will dissolve when we have samples that are not 100 degrees or 100 grams of water. So if we take a look at that, uh, let's see here. Let's ask ourselves, I'm going to move this guy over. Let's ask ourselves um, how many grams... of potassium chloride, KCl, will dissolve in 200 grams of water at 50 degrees C. Alright, to solve this problem, please make sure you copy this down. We go to 50 degrees C. We go up until we find potassium chloride. We go over and we read it to be 40 grams. But that's 40 grams per 100 grams of water. And if we have 200 grams of water, we need X. Now, there's one of two ways to do this. Cross, multiply, and divide. And you'll get 80 grams. Okay. KCL. Um, or you can see that it simply doubles from 100 to 200, so you automatically double the 40 to 80. That's another thing we can do with the solubility curve. All right, let's get rid of this stuff. Okay. The last thing that we're going to look at is the fact that there are some chemicals that actually decrease in solubility as you heat them. The cesium sulfate down here, this one is a little uh, not clear as to why this decreases so much, but the ammonia is the one I really want to talk about. Ammonia is typically a gas at room temperature, so it already doesn't want to be in a liquid. When you dissolve a gas in a liquid, it doesn't want to be there, just like your carbon dioxide in your pop that you drink. It doesn't want to be there because it's a gas at room temperature. So if you leave your pop out too long, it goes flat because the gas escapes. Same thing with ammonia in water, and that's the liquid ammonia that we buy. It doesn't want to be there. As we heat up the solution, the ammonia just has too much energy and cannot stay in solution. All right. The other one I want to point out real quick for, before I let you go for the night is sodium chloride. Sodium chloride really does not change its solubility across the 100 degrees from freezing to boiling of water. Now you might say, well, that's kind of odd. Not really. We actually need this to happen. If you think about the oceans, the salinity of the oceans do not, does not really typically change between the Arctic Ocean and, say, the South Pacific. So it's a pretty good thing that sodium chloride doesn't change its solubility with varying degrees of temperature. All right, guys, we're going to work on the back side of your worksheet tomorrow. The front side has more directions on it than what I've discussed here. You can use that as another tool to help you reference as you solve the problems tomorrow in class. I hope you took good notes tonight. If not, please rewind and get the notes down that you need. Otherwise, have a wonderful evening.